Well, it is my pleasure to introduce a friend, someone that I've worked with and uh, known for a number of years. He has a real heart for revival and spiritual awakening. Byron Paulus. Wow. Byron, welcome. Well, I do consider you a dear friend, Randy, and colleague, and man, co-laborer to see the glory of God. Amen. A little bit more about my buddy, my buddy Byron. He is the founder of One Cry, which is a nationwide call for revival and spiritual awakening. For over three decades, he served as president and CEO of Life Action Ministries, which is kind of a parent thing that got One Cry going. As an author, speaker, and proven leader, Byron is passionate about mobilizing God's people to seek him for another revival and spiritual awakening. And you're going to hear that very clearly. Mm. Uh, on a personal note, he's married to his dear wife, Sue, and they have three incredible children who are all married now. And he has 13 grandkids and they live in wow. Niles, Michigan. So again, Byron, thanks for being with us today and spending a few minutes to talk about a subject that we both are passionate about. Revive. Why are we so passionate about that, Byron? Well, maybe it's the 27 grandkids you have and the 13 that I do, or the 37, excuse Just me, 37. that makes Just... us passionate. And uh, <laughs> I have to say this, Randy, and I don't want to take up time here, but my two favorite lights, since I have 13 grandkids, and you could relate, yes. are the headlights and the taillights, the headlights and the taillights. So yeah, I yeah, I get them come coming and going. Go. Yeah. But when it comes to revival, I'll use that as a, a metaphor. I love see it coming, and oh. I think we're seeing it come. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and I think there are ways to sustain that kind of work of God so it doesn't disappear right away. Yeah. You know, uh, your your predecessor, Del Faisenfeld Jr., uh, you know, had an amazing story, and we're not going to get into it. We did the last time we did a, a, a podcast together, talk about Connersville, Indiana, uh, but... Uh, I think it's helpful for us to understand the distinction between, you know, revival and awakening, just, just so we can use that. In fact, I have a chart that, that, uh, that you guys put together in your great book on the subject. And uh, in fact, I can pull that up just briefly on our screen here. And, uh, uh, you know, just to, to show folks what we're talking about. If I trust you can see that. Why don't yeah. you explain what, what this thing is all about? Well, I do believe there are precursors, obviously, to uh, revival. And I think uh, in cultures that there uh, really is that season of decline. Letter of Ravenhill talked about that so explicitly. And uh, when we decline, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we think of judgment's going to come. It's going to come to the lost world and uh, God's uh, going to judge them. But that's not what scripture says. Revival's for God's people and he judges based on on believers revive us again that thy people so mm -hmm. he'll discipline his people until we just get desperate and we cry out and say god we cannot live without your presence mm -hmm. and then that's when revival comes you know it's turning it's praying it's uniting i, I think i think turning and repentance is one pillar that's needed today mm. and and i would say uniting because of john 17 and, yes. and psalm 133 is so yes. important and then uh, that flows out of revival the best form of evangelism falls on the heels of revival i believe and that's when there's awakening among believers so let me mm -hmm. summarize it maybe randy with something that i've been uh, saying a lot about lately is i believe revival begins with god's people awakening is for the lost and transformation then is the culture. Wow. When you think about one sixth of the population in the United States came to Christ in the first great awakening, if one sixth the population came to Christ today, you extrapolate that, and it's about 60 or 70 million believers. Do you think that would impact, uh, impact culture? And Big so we're, we're, you know, we go after the culture when God says, wait a minute, it's in the church. Let me take care of the church. That will result in evangelism, yes. and then the culture will be transformed. Yeah, you and I are on the very same page there. I mean, I got friends. I love them. I, as you know, my background is government. Yeah, yeah. God has a role for government. Look at yeah. Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, yeah. 13 and 14. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I remember when I was working at Michigan Family Forum, and we were trying to, yeah. to make changes to our divorce laws, you know, no-fault divorce. In fact, I tell people, and they kind of drop their jaw when I tell them, you know, it's easier for me to divorce my wife. We've been married 54 years 
Hmm. Than to fire somebody I hired a week ago. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Marcia has no ability to stop a divorce. What somebody that I hired a week ago would have a cause of action of wrongful discharge. So anyhow, we were trying to change those laws. We came close. Yeah, yeah. But one of the state senators, who's a Christian, he said to me, "You know, Rand. Um, he says that uh, that that public policy is a lagging indicator." of where the culture is. And I take it one step deeper, and you've already implied it, that the culture is, is a step deep. It, it, the, below that, a lagging indicator of culture is the health and effectiveness of us, the church. You know, we, we, we know Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people talk about us, we have to, we're the heart. You can't expect non-Christians to behave like Christians, yeah. but we right. have to be light and salt. And yeah. we haven't been like we, we like we should be. As somebody says, as goes the West, so goes the world. As goes America, so goes the West. Wow. As goes the church, so goes America. Yes. And you would extend it with your background and, and mine. As goes the family, so goes the church. But we think the church is a reflection of the culture. Yes. But in reality, in God's design, the culture is yes. always a reflection of the church. That is profound, Byron. And I pray people will hear what we're saying. It's got to start with me. Yeah. I can't keep pointing my finger out there. I got to say, Randy, are you doing everything you're supposed to do to be all in with Jesus every yeah. day? And uh, and so that, that's that's where it's about. Well, what's exciting, and uh, you've you've been talking about, in fact, as we record this, apparently this is the the one year anniversary yeah. of something that happened in uh, Kentucky a year yeah. ago. Yeah, you know, it is absolutely astonishing that. Uh, in a season where people didn't think revival was even possible, they didn't know theologically if God ever would before yeah. his return, and all these, you know, were too far gone, and things get worse and worse, and so forth, and uh, all of a sudden, God just literally sovereignly touches down in Asbury. The chapel that started yesterday, but those students, and this is one of the takeaways, and I, I've written down 10 takeaways a year later from Asbury. Okay. And one of the takeaways is they lingered. Most of the people left chapel. It was not an astonishing message by any means if you listen to it, but there were students who lingered in that chapel wow. and lingered and lingered and gave God space. And the next day, which would have been one year ago today, God says, okay you all are serious. You're willing to wait upon me, as Isaiah said, until he comes and God came. So I just sit here today, Randy, one year later, uh, you know, uh, I know this is all digital and it's on media and social media, but yep. I, I don't know if the people realize in that three week span of what God did in Asbury, there were 1 billion, that's what the bill be, TikTok views about Asbury. Wow. On the final night, when we were blessed to produce the final night of the Collegiate Day of Prayer there at Asbury, uh, on the final night of what God was doing there, there were over 500 million viewers of that final night. I don't think we can fathom the extent to with which God legitimized revival, is what I call it. And, you know, what is it? Wilmore, I mean, uh, 65, 7,000 people population, and some sure, estimate sure. 100,000 100, show up. Uh, so I could go on and on about how excited I am that there is a new, uh, a new faith, a new hope. Mm -hmm. It's a new day when it comes to the church and pastors that really want to see God work to make space and, and just unbelievable things he's doing. And I'd love to give some illustrations, but you're asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll want to get some of those illustrations, but I just wanted to bring in the fact that that uh, we we see in other parts of the country this we call them Gen Z. These are people right. in their twenties, basically, yeah. so, that are on. You know, again, you can read the media about how Gen Z people are just you know doing nothing of value and so on but but the ones that we're seeing here locally in in west yeah. michigan yeah just blow me away they are yeah. i mean i go to these events and i get so inspired by their excitement about jesus and love for him and can't wait to share it with other people god's doing something yeah he is and, and so, right now go ahead yeah right now so um 
and last Thursday, and you know this, Randy, well, but the last Thursday of every February is the Collegiate Day of Prayer. Yes. Two, it's 200 years running, and then it was lapsed for 100 years, resurrected about 12 years ago. And about the time you were here, actually, it was resurrected by Dave Warren and our staff and a group yep. of collegiate ministry leaders. And it's been held at Yale, et cetera, simulcast this year. And I'm talking uh, amazing miracles to make this happen. But Baylor University there in Waco heard about how God used the simulcast broadcast. I mean, TBN and CBN, the largest Spanish network, because of what God was doing among Gen Z, wanted to pick up on it. And so it was a massive distribution a year ago, even into Arabic countries uh, in, in some of the largest satellite distributions. And, wow. and so they heard about it and said, look, we know there's a movement here at Baylor among our students. Sure. And James Poole, who you know, was uh, uh, there for the last six years, just praying and, mm -hmm. and connecting with pastors. And so this year, in three weeks from tomorrow night, uh, three weeks from this past Friday when this is being aired, probably, uh, we're having the Collegiate Day of Prayer simulcast originating from Baylor. Now get this, uh, there are three other campuses or four that we're going to be uh, cutting away to, watching them pray as they're gathering. And one is University of Tennessee. Another is Asbury because yeah, of, of last course, year. that's good. Another one is North Dakota State University. But hey, oh, wow. here's the one I love most because it's down the street. Notre Dame has agreed to be a place where college students can gather and pray wow. on a collegiate day of prayer, no strings attached. There's a movement, like you were talking, there's a movement of about 100 to 150 students began a year ago that are now meeting every Thursday night in prayer and worship. And Praise you know, God. Praise God's just God. there. That's all I can say. So he's up to something with Gen Z. You're right. So here's the here's the question, and it, it's again a little bit tongue in cheek as I ask the question. So for those of us that are not Gen Z, we're a little bit a little bit older than that. Wouldn't you agree with that, Byron? Okay. Uh, do we just barely. do we just kind of sit in our chair, put our feet up on our desk, and wait for the revival to come? Yeah, you know, let me let me make a comment and then maybe address that more directly. But I think what might surprise some of our listeners and viewers is that the Gen Z is hungry to listen to the mm. older generation. Mm. They're wanting to, and they're seeking out the older generation and asking a ton of questions. They're wanting to be coached. They're wanting to be mentored. So actually on the last uh, this, end of this month, on that Thursday and Friday, uh, I just did an invite only. And Randy, I know you're praying about joining us, but about uh, 60 individuals who are revivalists at heart and yeah. prayer leaders are coming together with campus ministry leaders, students that will be there, hmm. and my generation, yeah. and for one reason, to cross-pollinate and hmm. cross-generation. And it's not only that they want to learn from us, we need to and want to learn from them. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah. uh, I, I can't wait for how that's going to yeah. play out in the long run of seeing this cross-generation diverse group of people interact. That's good. That's and, we, good. And, and basically the question we're going to be asking together, what is God doing right now? Yeah. And how should we respond to what God doing to accelerate the movements that are taking place? Yeah. You mentioned earlier that one issue as Jesus prayed in John 17, in fact, in four verses, he prays three times and he's referring to, to those that will believe in the message, us, that we be one. And he ends up saying, may they be perfectly one so that the world will know that you sent me, says Jesus, yeah, and that yeah. you love them as much as you love me. Incredible promise. Yeah. So we're talking about unity. We have a mutual friend, Brent, Brent Brooks from yeah. Reno, Nevada area. And he makes it very clear that we're not talking about uniformity. We're not talking about union. We're talking about unity. That yeah. We have different ages, we have different races, we have different, you know, backgrounds and so on, but we are one in Christ. That's right. In unity. And that gives joy to God. And it's a message to the world. The world would love to have somehow bring people together, but they can't do it. But God, through the gospel uh, and, and through Christ work uh, can do that by his spirit so this is yeah and i i might just amend that i mean not amend it but uh, just the other thought regarding that because that's so true 
But I think also what happens there is remember Jesus there, that's his final prayer. What's he doing next? He's next to the father interceding, right? Yes. So he is, he is there asking the father, please yes. do this if we're unified together as a body. So yes. just back to Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is for brethren yes. to dwell together in unity. And there I command my blessing. <laughs> and I'm saying the unity brings about power. Yep. And yep. that's what the world wants to see today is not yep. just the oneness, but the power that will flow out that's of that good. oneness that God promises. Yep. Now, I find it really interesting that the church in places where there is persecution, like China, Iran, Afghanistan, and other places in the world, India, places of India, the church is growing. Yeah. Whereas in America, there's been, if you look at numbers, again, maybe the last year or two, we're going to start to see a turnaround because of this Gen Z thing, but it's been a decline. Yeah. Do we need persecution to wake us up, Byron? Well, my best way to answer that is I was um, having a Q&A session at Moody Pastors Conference several years ago mm -hmm. and uh, asked for uh, uh, one more question. And a gentleman in the back raised their hand. He says, like, I have a comment and then I have a question. Okay. He said, I, I, I have a comment. He said, I'm from Uganda and we've had revival in Uganda, but it was a result of devastation. Oh, yeah. And he says, so my question is this. I believe God's going to send revival to America. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's either going to come through devastation or desperation. There and there were go. four of us and you would know the names of them that were sitting on that panel, including Dr. Lutzer. Sure. And he, uh, 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 when he said, what are you going to do to make sure it's desperation and not devastation? Mm. And everybody was silent. We did not have a good answer. And I remember after I dismissed them, I got on my face there and just got said, oh, God. Mm. you please help yes. us understand how can we make sure it's yes. desperation and not devastation? So yes. I believe revival may come through devastation, persecution, but I also believe God's desi desire mm. is to keep his promises. And if we will get desperate and yes. cry out, then he'll send revival. And that certainly, as we pray, we have different groups, of course, you've got your groups and of course we've ours with grand awakening and yes. others. Is just crying out to God to Lord make us desperate, get us to that point of quit worshiping our our, our luxury, our, our comfort, our yeah. material goods. Who cares about that? We we right. it's Jesus. I mean, That's this right. life is so short. That's what got my attention in high school. That we're giving my life to Christ was computing. Seventy years is just a little bit less than twenty six thousand days. Yeah. Wow. less than a million hours and so this life doesn't you know again we, we want to do our best and we're thankful for all the stuff we have but god help the church to be all in each one of us to give god everything daily yeah somehow i think it was uh leonard ravenhill told me one time if you if you want to have a revival if you want a painless pentecost there is none if you want a painless pentecost there is none so I think sometimes we to, mm -hmm. we want the blessing and not the blesser, as you were saying. Yeah. Not revival, not the reviver. We want to yeah. we want to move to not the mover, and uh, just Jesus, Jesus, uh, Jesus. Well, I so thank God for all that you have consistently done for almost what? How many years have you been in this revival um, business, sir? <laughs> Yeah, I, I hate to call it business, but sure feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> now, it's been 49 years. That's, that you know gives away my age a little bit, but I, I entered into a revival ministry. For one year, I was going to go back in the business world. And uh, while, number one, God met me in his presence and realized I was religious, but I was lost, came to Christ my first week in revival ministry. Wow. And that changed my uh, priorities a little bit. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so here I am 49 years later instead of one year later. And, uh, you know, you know this, you're a good example of this. And I was with, uh, you know, Glenn Shepard, that name, Dick Eastman. I was with both of those gentlemen who just, Dick Eastman just turned 80 and his wife 80 last week. And we were together with them. And uh, 
they are not slowing down. They're traveling internationally at 80. And it's like, hey, why? Why would I slow down at this season after I've invested my whole life and all of a sudden that's not what I should do anymore? And I just, uh, we need to be refired, not retired. And Randy, I do want to say this before you uh, wrap up here at whenever. Um, you know, I look at three historic and contemporary influence centers in Christendom. Uh, I think of Nashville, Tennessee, that houses uh, denominations the largest. I think of Wheaton, Illinois, and I think of Grand Rapids. Mm. And so when I know that you are there in Grand Rapids, believing God for Grand Awakening, and if revival begins with God's people and the leaders of God's people, yes. I, I just I just can't tell you how thrilled I am that you have taken this mission and message and you're giving your life to it there. Yeah. And uh, don't ever underestimate whoever you are out there, yeah. how God wants to use, uh, I, I don't mean this to reflect on you, but the unlikely, I'm an unlikely person. Oh yeah, totally. So we're all totally. unlikely. And Asbury was one of the most unlikely places demographically, sure. but not in God's eyes because uh, God it says, I meet with those that remember me and my ways in Isaiah 64. And Asbury has had a history of revival. So they remembered God and his ways. And I think that's one of the reasons God chose to ignite something there in Wilmore, Kentucky, of all places. Amen. Uh, that's so good. In fact, we're, we're scheduling, we're going to have a pastor's prayer summit coming up uh, the end of April, 1st of May. And uh, it's really going to be, we believe, a launch pad for for God to do something even huger, more more large here in, in West Michigan, but then spreading beyond. So yeah. we're thankful for what God has done and excited about what we sense that he's going to be doing for his. We don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we as a nation deserve the judgment of God, you know, with abortion, same-sex marriage legalized and pornography production mm -hmm. and con consumption. Uh, and the church just being lukewarm, kind of like the church of Laodicea in, in the book of Revelation, it feels to me. Mm. But I believe that God in his mercy is reaching out. He's, he continues to use you and so many other people. What what an amazing God we, we serve. Amen, amen, amen. And, um, and Randy, I'll just end on this. As I've met yesterday with some people, you know, like Sammy Tippett. And yes, Bill, uh, yes. A young generation, next gen guy, Nico yep. Peel and so forth. We we were putting together those two days where we just really want to hear from God as as these revival roundtable leaders in discussion and prayer and yep. not preaching. We don't need any more preaching. We just need God. So we're designing it. And we thought, what do we do in the final hour? Uh, and we just decided the final hour. Uh, I, I'll say this to, to give you a context. Every time, and I've known Sammy Tippett for 40 years, probably okay, 30 years. Sure. I'm on probably once a month a call on Whenever he's asked to pray, he always begins his prayer. And I mean, underline, highlight, always. He says, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. And then he continues to pray. Oh, so we're going to end that hour on what you just talked about. I love it. I love we're gonna it. We're going to hear I about love it. focusing on Jesus. And then to bring these generational, yeah. ethnic, denominational, diverse yes, leaders yes. together in the Lord's Supper, because nothing unites us more than the cross. I love it. Oh, that's so good, Byron. Why don't you close us in prayer, would you? I would love to. And Lord, uh, I'd love to pray because of who we're praying to. Help us never to forget that you are the same yesterday, what we read about in scripture, what we read about in our history books, what we read about in awakenings and revivals of the past. God, you are the same yesterday today and what you're doing and stirring and moving and uh, giving us mercy drops in comparison to what you can do. Yes. And then Lord, tomorrow, God, we long that tomorrow or today, that there would be this outpouring of your spirit that mm. literally historians would have to record. Mm. God visited America again. Amen. And so, Lord, we long for the knowledge of the yes. glory of your name to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen. And God, we believe, as Randy and I know from the founder of our ministry that we serve together with, would often say, as long as you are on your throne, revival is as possible as the sun rising tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Help us every time we see a sunrise to remember this could be the day mm -hmm. because you are on your throne 
and because you are powerful and you long for your name to be glorified and you long for your people to encounter intimacy with you. So God, revival really is no more than falling in love with Jesus all over again. I pray that your church would do that collectively, corporately, and uh, even universally. And we just trust you for that. Thank you. And thank you. And we love you, Jesus. Amen. 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 We love you, Jesus. Amen. Yes, Byron, thank you, brother. God Amen. richly bless you and your family, your ministry. Yeah. And thanks we'll stay, for we'll stay in touch. <laughs> Guys like you, my wife tells me, don't quit, Byron. <laughs> Keep going till the final breath. I, I love I, it. 